If you're trying to make any kind of meaningful, effective change in your life, you've come to the right place. Good. Ladies and gents, welcome back to We're Talking Shift. I am Lori Bischoff, and it is good to be back after a nice little summer hiatus. I am very excited to kick off the season with a special guest whom I'm pretty sure many of you will recognize. Uh, before I introduce him, though, let me just say that I think this is going to be a very inspiring episode of We're Talking Shift, you are going to learn about what it is to be a cobra, why it's important to know the difference between discipline and self-discipline. And we're also going to dive into the subject, well, one that I am greatly concerned about and one that I know is very near and dear to my guest's heart as well. And of course, we're going to talk about a bunch of other good stuff that will help you shift and up-level your life. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about Sean Kanan. Sean is an actor, a producer, and an author. He is well known for his role as villain Mike Barnes in the movie The Karate Kid Part 3. Sean has had a long and very successful career on several daytime shows that include General Hospital, which used to be one of my favorites when I was a teenager, The Bold and the Beautiful and The Young and the Restless. In 2019, Sean created and stars in the drama series Studio City, where he won the 2021 Daytime Emmy for Outstanding Limited Series as the executive producer and creator. Studio City streams exclusively on Amazon Prime. Make sure to check it out, it is very cool. Sean has authored three books. His first book, The Modern Gentleman, Cooking and Entertaining with Sean Kanan. Next, he wrote Success Factor X, which became an Amazon new release bestseller in one week. And his latest book, Way of the Cobra, I have it right here. We're gonna be diving into a little bit of that today. So without further ado, Sean, welcome to We're Talking Shift. Thanks, Lori, it's nice to be here. It's great to have you. I know you're really um, very busy, so I uh, very much appreciate you taking the time to hang out with me today. Happy to have a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet. Um, okay, so you, you're you clearly a really busy guy. I mean, you've had a long, long acting career. Um, you are involved in several charitable organizations, I understand, as well as I think some um, animal advocacy groups too. Yeah, uh, yeah. You have lobbied on Capitol Hill to raise awareness about bullying, which I find to be really interesting. We're going to talk about that. And um, I believe you serve as the International Youth Ambassador for Boo to Bullying. Boo to Bullying, correct. All right. You have a wife, five kids. <laughs> oh, and I believe you've been studying Mandarin and Italian as well. Do I have that? That is, that is all true. Guilty. I mean, do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> you know, wow. I, I do. I, I, I like to get up really early, uh, which is something that's um, that I didn't do for a long time in my life. You know, uh, part part of the whole transformation that I underwent when I was uh, writing Way of the Cobra was making some pretty profound changes in my own life. And one of them was completely shifting myself from not being a morning person to being a very early morning person. And, you know, the, the results in my life have been extraordinary from doing that. So I, mm -hmm. I have lots of time because I've sort of requisitioned uh, hours that I, I would have been using with my pillow. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I've I've actually been working toward doing that same thing myself. Um, trying to like get up about twenty minutes earlier, half hour mm. earlier, forty five minutes earlier. You know, and it does if you um, it does work if you just are consistent. And yeah, I gotta say, you know, I, you know, the thing about it is that if you can get up, you know, even twenty minutes earlier. Yeah. You know, and if you can center yourself, I mean, for me, like I start my morning in gratitude, you know, I, I, I meditate, you know, shut out that the, the monkey chatter inside your brain and you haven't started to engage with all this sort of external chaos that the day mm -hmm. brings and it can change the entire trajectory of your day. Um, mm -hmm. You know, most people, they, they get up, they, they slam down some coffee and they're already kind of on the hamster wheel. They're doing this. Always. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. I'm going to tell you something. I, you know, I'm not as big of a, a disproponent of checking your, your communication and everything in the morning as a lot of people. I think it shouldn't be the first thing you do. I mean, I definitely, for me, um, you know, 
run through my morning routine, which involves, like I said, some meditation, visualization, all of that sort of stuff before I get into, um, you know, what lies ahead for the day. But what's really nice about it is, you know, everyone else in the house usually isn't awake yet. And it's really, you know, you feel like you're taking some time for yourself and you don't feel rushed. Right. And not being not being rushed has so many incredibly positive byproducts. I mean, you know, just by by not being stressed in the morning, it can actually help you lose weight because when you're stressed, you you overproduce cortisol. And yeah. when you overproduce cortisol, it makes it difficult for you to lose weight. So when you're when your day is starting kind of in that organizational mindset where you're also kind of centered, mm-hmm. there's so many benefits. So I, I recommend it. You know, I always I, I say in my book, I say, look, if you know you're looking to really become successful. Nobody who's a captain of industry is sleeping until 11 o'clock in the morning. Right. But conversely, it takes more than just getting up early because if getting up early was the only, um, you know, benchmark for being successful, you know, every little kid getting up at eight o'clock in the morning to watch cartoons for four hours would be, you know, a CEO. So yeah, exactly. You gotta, you gotta integrate the getting up early and the doing something positive. We have millions of geniuses out there <laughs> <laughs> creating the next best thing rather than a handful. Um, I know I totally get that. I do the same thing, though. I, I do get um, I get up early. I have my bookends, I call them. So yeah. I do the same thing that you just described in the morning. I get up early. The only reason I check my phone for a minute is to make sure I don't have an emergency like an exactly. early morning podcast guest that said I have to cancel or, you know, or a kid has called in, or, you know, whatever, because my phone's on silent all night. So I check, make sure there's no emergencies, and then it goes back down. And then I do my spiritual reading, my meditating, my visualization. And then I end the night the same way with some That's spiritual cool. reading, you know, blah, blah. So I feel like it's kind of like you've, um, you've suited yourself up, you've grounded and centered and got your whole being in this wonderful place before you even run into your day you know especially when you are somebody i think that's enthusiastic about being uh, creating and producing and making the most out of your day it's so easy to want to get up and get to it what are you going you want to get going you know i think a lot of times when people talk about um starting the morning with with sort of a, a spiritual um orientation some people they're they're defense shields go up because they they think okay this is going to become a religious conversation and it, it's it's not um yeah. you know for me um living in gratitude does take um it does take a a relationship with my higher power but right. it doesn't have to i mean really what it's about is you know if you're if you're living in gratitude you're living in the present and if you're mm-hmm. living in the present you're not you know lamenting the past which Right. What a lot of people, um, you know, they term depression. I'm not talking about clinical depression, right. you know, actual depression where people take medication. But, you know, a lot of people just, you know, they say so, so quickly, oh, I'm depressed. Well, usually that comes from people focusing on the past. And if people yeah. are anxious, it's because they're projecting into the future, which nobody knows. And so often never even happens. And so when you when you yeah. start the day, just kind of listing five or six things that you're grateful about. You're mm-hmm. rooted in the present. And that mm-hmm. is the strongest position to be in, um, yeah. I think, for success and for your peace. Totally. It, it, when, you're, when you're in that place, you know, it, I think so many people are like, that. you get the old eye roll, oh, gratitude. You know, we've been hearing about gratitude and gratitude rocks ever since The Secret came out, you know, in 2007 yeah. Yeah. or whatever. But what, what they don't realize is that it's, it's really a it's a mind training because it's not about it when you are when you take that time to train your mind to focus on what you appreciate and what's good you spend more time mentally you give the real estate the mental real estate to the things that are going right that that you like that you can appreciate that are not terrible or you know something to fear and the more that you focus on those things the more obviously you attract those things into your life i was just going to say that it's so true look it's very easy to allow yourself to look around and and uh, you know make a list of all the things that you think you should deserve and that you think you you don't have and comparing yourself to other people's success and that is it's just a fool's errand i mean there's really no benefit in it and you know I think everybody who wakes up in the morning uh, already has one thing to be grateful for. And, um, 
yeah, it, it, it's, it's really made a profound difference in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I started, um, I started adding in to that about a year ago. I, I woke up and, and I was thinking, how amazing is it that while I'm sleeping, while I'm not consciously, you know, conscious, awake, life is breathing me and life is beating my heart. Something else is keeping me alive and I don't even, you're not even aware of it. It's right, just right. that it's that wonderful force that is doing it for you. And so, yes, to just wake up and open your eyes and realize something has brought you to this next day and you didn't have to do anything. You just, you just literally did nothing. You the just, gift. right. And so it's just so many things that, yeah, they don't have to be these big things like, oh, I'm so grateful for, you know, this, uh, uh, all of the money I have in the bank. Oh, that's a nice thing to be grateful for, but, or the, the material things you have, it's, it's not about the big things. It's about all of these, Th these things that you don't even think about, like breathing. You know, I think it's, I think also that, you, you know, it's really beneficial if you can cultivate a mindset where you are able to perpetuate meaningful happiness that's not predicating, predicated on certain things happening. Like right. if this happens, then I'm going to be happy. You know, it's entirely possible to have a really shitty day and still be a happy person. Yes. You know, life, life does what life does. It's, you know, we have zero control over life. And, and as soon as you learn that the only thing you have control over is your reaction to external stimuli, um, you're going to realize that there's times that, you know, um, things fall your way and there's times things don't fall your way. And if you cannot get spun out about the bad things and conversely, not get overly manically excited about the good things and, and walk that middle path. Mm -hmm. At least in my experience, you're, you're a much happier person. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, I, I talk a lot about that with, with clients, new clients, especially. And I say, think about it this way. If you think about happiness as a state, mm. a state yeah. of being and not an emotion, like, yes. You know, you can have a happy emotion, joyful, you can have the whole range of emotions from negative and feeling depressed and low and frustrated and angry all the way up yeah. to I feel peaceful or I feel joyful, whatever. But all of those emotions can happen within the context of your overall state yeah. of happiness, yeah. which means, yeah, I'm, I'm going to a funeral for a loved one today. I feel sad, but you're still having the feeling within your overall state of happiness. Right. You're not going to live there forever. Yeah. And, you know, it, it makes you a much stronger person too, because, you know, if you're not able to be pulled off course from the external events that happen constantly, yeah, um, you know, it, you, you project a, a strength and a, a a solidness and it's yeah. attractive. It's attractive to the universe and it's attractive to other people. Right. And when you when you're kind of like a bombastic pinball that's just ricocheting left and right based right. upon the external events, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know that's that, that's somebody that's you know you're, you're you're effectively being manipulated by life. I guess. Yeah, yeah. You're a puppet. puppet and, yeah. Yeah, everything and everyone else gets to be the puppet master. They have the the keys to your kingdom. So right. you, you gotta learn how to hold, grab onto your keys and, yeah. and find your foundation so that yes. you're not just blown in every direction. Yeah, it's important. Um, so, okay, it, again, you clearly are a busy guy. You don't have a ton of spare time, although you have more now that you get up earlier. But in a world uh, where there are literally copious amounts of self-improvement books and personal development books and all of that, you know, books on how to better yourself in your life. I wrote one myself right. 10 years ago, so I get it. In fact, we have a lot of similarities in our books. Um, but what inspired you then to carve out the time to do way of the cobra well there's okay there's a lot to unpack there so there's there's two primary questions that i'm seeing so the first is why is my book different than a lot of other books i'll tell you this and i say it right in the um the introduction of the book yeah. that 
you know, a, a lot of what you hear in my book, uh, you, you may have heard before because there are certain truths that are universal truths that, you know, you look at, you know, what Jesus said, that which you reap, so shall you sow. It's, it's the same as Buddha, the, you know, the law right. of cause and effect. I mean, there are truths that are universal truths. Right. Um, where I think my book differs is uh, the messenger, um, my story. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if you're, if you're a 15 year old and you're fighting with your mom and your dad, and they're trying to give you really good, solid advice, you just can't hear it because you're in that, you know, that rebellious teenage thing that's blocking you. It doesn't matter how great the advice is from your parents. You're just, it's just not permeating. Right. And you know, what I say in my book is I hope that a message that you may have heard many times before is finally going to hit the mark because of the delivery system that I'm using. That's yeah. the first. The second thing, and this is more um, to the follow-up book to Way of the Cobra, which I'm, I'm very close to finishing and will hopefully be out this, not hopefully, it's going to be out this fall. It's going to be called Welcome to the Kumite. Um, I say, look, a lot of what you hear may seem like it's new information, but it's not. You right. know it. You've always known it. You may have forgotten it. You may not have discovered it yet, but it lives within you. You just have to discover it. Okay, why did I write this book? So around the time of my 50th birthday, I had this, this really fantastic 50th birthday where I was awarded a star on the Palm Springs Walk of Fame. Uh, you know, the mayor gave me a proclamation, friends, family, blah, 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 big thing. And um, after, uh, and it coincided with my, my birthday too. So there was parties and all that sort of stuff. And after the smoke cleared uh, and the hangover wore off and everyone had left, I kind of, you know, was looking in the mirror going, okay, what's next? What's, what's the next chapter here? And I also felt slightly like a fraud because, you know, I had, I had achieved a lot of stuff in my life and yet I still wasn't really feeling successful. And I was, I was like 35 pounds overweight. I, I really didn't have, this, this, this was over the course of a couple of years, but I really didn't have any prospects at that point in time for any meaningful acting work. And, you know, I was, I was interacting with some demons that I thought I had put to, to rest. And I realized that if I was going to save myself from falling off the precipice into the sea of mediocrity um mm -hmm. i was gonna have to change some things very quickly and very dramatically and so you know it was kind of like a call to action for me and and in writing this book i realized that if i was gonna you know sort of elevate myself to a, a position of being a sensei a teacher mm -hmm. uh i had to walk it like i was talking it you know and so Fortunately, um, you know, I had a lot of faith and I had faith that I could do it. And I, I had some incredible um, transformations in my life that I had previously been unable to achieve um, with any consistency. Mm -hmm. And I really, I really do attribute a lot of that to, you know, my faith in the almighty and a lot of really diligent hard work and a lot of really getting honest with myself. And so in the course of the year in which I wrote the book, um, my second book, um, Way, uh, uh, Success Factor Exit Come Out and Become an, an Amazon New Release Bestseller, um, my, my show Studio City finally got made, nominated for 16 Emmys in the first, uh, you know, the first 11 episodes, we won three, and I lost the 35 pounds. And you know, I don't say this to impress people, I say to mm -hmm. impress upon them what is possible. But you yeah. have to, you have to not only get clear. And I talk about this a lot in in the new book. I had to let a part of myself die. Mm -hmm. I had to let a part of myself that was no longer serving me and was disempowering me die, so that I could allow a new part to be reborn. Yeah. And really, what this concept of Welcome to the Kumite is the Kumite represents an epic battle. It's against your greatest opponent. Your greatest opponent is you. And what that requires is on a daily, hourly, minutely basis that you are constantly doing battle with your previous self to emerge as a better version of yourself. Yeah. And 
And that's what this new book is all about. You know, um, I go into much, in much more detail um, ab about a lot of what I was really struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was really struggling with, with uh, an alcohol issue and, and some other issues. And I had had, you know, moments of um, a lot of success and, and the ability to um, sort of stay in the straight and narrow, but I just wasn't able to do it consistently. And, and what I realized was a, a lot of the habits and a lot of the systems that I had in my life, which may have worked for me in the past, were no longer working. And so I had to really do a diagnostic and really deconstruct where it was I wanted to go and how I was going to get there. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what the book is about. And that's uh, and, and Way of the Cobra, you know, um, it, it illustrates the strategies and philosophy that I used to get to the point that I am now. And now mm -hmm. it's, how do you, okay, great. Now, now you've taken it to this point, you know, you don't want to plateau. You want to take it even further. And, and more than that, I, I want to, I want to be able to inspire other people. And, and so I, I have more tricks and information that I want to share with everybody um, because I continue to see it bring absolute miracles in my life that I never could have imagined. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And I'm very excited about your next book. I hope you'll come back. And Absolutely. We can, yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. Um, so let's tell our listeners, our viewers, um, why that analogy of a cobra? What do you mean? What is a cobra? So COBRA is an acronym formed from the words character, optimization, balance, respect, and abundance. And those are the five pillars of way of the COBRA. Character being the absolute most important. Character is everything. Character defines your destiny. Uh, it, it, it absolutely, I believe, is the most critical and, and defining aspect of everyone's life. And you sure. need to not only build it daily, but guard it with your life. And unfortunately, character is one of those things that can be uh, burned to the ground in a matter of moments where it took yeah. a lifetime to build. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the book is set up in the structure that I'm a, a sensei, a teacher, you're a student in my dojo. The chapters are divided into belts, yeah. taking you from white to black belt. And, um, you know, this is the best advice that I've, not only acquired over my lifetime, but I've also put into practical use. And, you know, there's philosophy in the book and philosophy is important because it teaches us to um, examine the bigger questions in life, to be introspective and self-aware, but philosophy without practical ap application, without strategies and tactics remains theoretical. Um, and, and, you know, so you have to be able to have the nuts and bolts strategies of how to take that philosophy and and bring it into your life to achieve the goals and results that you want right yeah i love the way you laid it out i think that's um it's so important because there are a lot of things out there about um you know pe people saying um you know just think this way uh do this stop doing that but it there's not an actual um step by step action steps you know that people can understand and go okay i can do that that's like you know crayons and stick figures i can do that and i can right. implement that um there's a lot of great advice but it's nice for people especially people that are just really stepping into the world of of self-improvement and personal development that not everybody is is doing that, you know, it, personal development is not a lazy man's game um, it, by, by any stretch. A lot of people are just not, a lot of people are in survival mode. And when you're in survival mode, anything beyond how do I make sure I have a roof over my head and food in my fridge and, you know, clothes on my back, anything beyond that um, seems like a luxury. And personal development and self-improvement oftentimes falls into that to that category um and it's kind of a you know on the other hand if if they are able to get you know a toe in the water in that arena obviously that's what helps you move out of survival mode 
but right I, I would i would i would also i would also counter that this is you know if you're in survival mode this is the perfect time to read a book like this whether it's mine yeah. or yours or somebody's you know what yes yeah. engage yourself right. because a lot of times when we're in survival mode and we've all been there mm -hmm. um the the trap is that you start operating out of fear right and you start making decisions that are based on feeling that you know, it's a world of scarcity rather than abundance. Mm -hmm. Things aren't going my way. And it's not enough. It's not enough. You start making decisions. You start getting jaded. All of that sort of stuff. And as you know, you know, listen. It's it's really easy to espouse this stuff when you're on top of the world. Mm -hmm. But the the time to really have you know, kind of the the you know, the rubber hit the road is when, when you're struggling and to take action and, and realize that, you know, you might be able to benefit from not only some outside motivation and inspiration, but some new tactics, right. looking at things, looking at things in a different way. And, you know, one of the things that I, I hope I accomplished effectively in the book is I, I did not want to sound, you know, sanctimonious and pompous i have the reason i wrote this book is because i have made every mistake in it a dozen times over mm -hmm. okay you tell people do not think that i'm living uh on a mountaintop in Kathmandu, levitating three feet off the ground right you know this this is from being in the trenches and having my ass kicked yep. and the only the only difference is that when i've had my ass kicked i've gotten up off the ground dusted myself off and gotten yeah. back at fight and that's what you got to do um you know my my martial arts teacher his name is sensei fumio demura and he's an amazing man considered to be one of the true masters of japanese uh, karate and I'm, I'm actually driving later today from los angeles to his dojo in santa Ana, uh which i'm very excited about but he he always says get knocked down seven times get up eight and and that's you know you listen to you know who's emerged as a really interesting motivational self-help guy is sylvester stallone I don't know if you've seen any of him. He's, yeah. you know, he, and, and it makes such obvious sense because Rocky is such a motivational movie. Yeah. But, you know, you, you, you start looking, if you're, if you're familiar with the Rocky movies, mm -hmm. there's dialogue in them that is like self-help 101, you know, where he talks about the world doesn't meet you halfway and it's not all rainbows and lollipops. And it's like, you know, right. you, you gotta be tough. And I think, you know, especially for like the younger generation, you know, and I'm not getting into a political discourse here, but there's so much of this, you know, wokeness and, and you know, everybody's got to be a winner and, you know, let, let's give it, let's give, you know, uh, ribbons yeah. for ninth place. And when you get out in the real world, it ain't like that. No, and, no. And we're raising a, a, a new generation of kids that I worry about, are, are, are they going to be equipped emotionally to to engage in the battle now and, we can already see that they're not by you right? know meltdowns that young people are having over things that are definitely not meltdown worthy uh, uh -oh. very fragile uh i stop totally looking, stop looking to be a victim you know stop looking to yeah. be offended everywhere because if you look to be offended everywhere you'll find it real easily right very quick you know what I mean? very Yes, it's it's everywhere. And I think um, but and I think you're right. I've, I've had several conversations with other people on that same subject um, that the, the woke ideology is a very flawed ideology and it is based on victimhood. So it's like people are wearing this victimhood with a badge of honor. Uh, and well, you know, no it's, so, it's so funny you say that, Lori, because I, you know, I talk about that in the book and I say, listen, there's a lot of advantages to being a victim ostensibly. I mean, you, in the early stages, garner a lot of sympathy and empathy. You get to be a part of a group. You get to trauma bond, you know, yeah. over, over your shared pain. And listen, I'm not saying that there aren't people that have experienced horrendous things in this world. And sure. in, that in that moment, there are people who are victims. But the decision to perpetuate that and continue being a victim is just that it's a choice and you know you can you know you look at people and you say let's take for instance you know a young girl who was you know sexually abused grew up in poverty um you know was told that she wasn't exactly camera friendly i and, know who you're talking about and, and she grew up to do pretty well for herself her, her her name starts with oprah exactly and, uh, 
you know, so yeah. it, it, it's a mindset because boy, I'll tell you, um, she sure had it rougher than I did. And, and I, I, you know, you, you wouldn't really fault somebody who came from that background and say, well, it's kind of, you know, you get why maybe they didn't do so well in life. And on some level, and there must've been some catalyst. And my, my, my assumption is it's the stories that she attached to what happened rather than attaching disempowering stories that I'm a victim I was mm -hmm. abused, blah, 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 blah. She said, I am going to create a life where I am never in that position again, where I have complete financial security and autonomy to not only protect myself, but to protect those people I love. And by right. attaching a different story, it makes yeah. all the difference. It does. It's because your story is full of meaning. And so yes. you're attaching a whole new meaning and then everything shifts, your emotions, your outlook, your attitude, everything shifts. Yeah, it's really interesting. One of the ways I help people distinguish be between being a victim and um, but still not minimizing if somebody has been victimized is that right there. Just because you've been victimized, that means somebody else has behaved horribly. Right. But you don't have to wear the crown of being a victim. You you can you can say, yes, horrible things have happened to me or to other people. They've been victimized. But yeah, you know, the, you know, you know, the thing about it is that that I'm about ninety nine point nine percent sure that when you know somebody victimizes somebody else, unfortunately, the person who does the victimizing goes on to live their life. You know, and that's their karma. Okay, yep. they're not right. They're not even thinking about it. And you carrying it with you allows it keeps you in a state of suspended animation of you know perpetual yeah. um victimhood and right all, you're a prisoner in your own mind now and you don't and you don't wind up leading the life that is your authentic life what you're meant to live and so you're 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 punished even worse than when the initial transgression sure. happened exactly because like you said now you're living in the past yeah and you're bringing your past into your every single present moment Everything. And yeah. so you're losing it. You you lose it. You become a prisoner in, in in the past event that no longer is reality. You know. Right. So yeah, you do sacrifice your present, which obviously then your future. If you continue to um, claim, because whatever you, you know, claim, you will you will be. Uh, if you are, I am a victim. That's what the universe says. Great. Let's make sure I give that to you. You know. You know. Here's the thing, too. You know. Human beings create stories as rationalizations and coping mechanisms. Sure. And unfortunately, human beings are also pretty lousy historians. Um, <laughs> we each see events through a prism of who we are, male, mm -hmm. female. Uh, 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 the fact that we live in this century, we see them differently than somebody from 400 years ago. Uh, a myriad of different things, right? So if we agree, that were not great historians. And, and one more sort of illustration of that is if I said to you, Lori, tell me about something that was really, really profound in your life. Walk me through the event, you know, the taste, the smell, the color, who is there, whatever. And, and you really thought about it and gave me uh, to your best ability without any kind of subterfuge, your best version of it. And then I took you to a movie theater and said, okay, now we're going to watch a movie of what actually happened. Mm -hmm. I would say it best at best you would be about 40 percent accurate and it's not because yeah. you're not a lovely person who's trying to tell the truth but it's because we're influenced myself included and so if we agree that we're all fairly lousy historians why not attach positive stories to the events that have happened in our life that are going to empower us rather than negative ones that are going to weigh like an anchor around our necks yeah, yeah exactly and that brings us back to you have the choice to do that you have the choice to manage your emotions and to manage your attitude if you just, uh, you know, accept the responsibility of controlling what you're dwelling on and the meaning that you're applying to things. Absolutely, right. you can change that at any any time you want, and things will yeah. shift. You know, it's a it's a it's a struggle for people because. You know, our, our thoughts and the, the patterned habitual ways that people have begun to think, they, it's hard for them to realize that they actually um, can control the way that they're feeling if they change their thoughts, because most people have it the other way around. Well, I feel like this, or you made me feel like that, so therefore I think 
this and really it's backwards um but you know it's it's a it's a learning curve and it's a it's a no. constant practice it, it is and you know that's a really good point that it's a learning curve you know it's progress not perfection yes you know bel believe me you know like i said i'm not you know levitating on top of some mountain i have i still have moments in my life where sure. you know the behavior that i want to exhibit and you know uh, allowing allowing my reactions to external stimuli to not be um congruent with with who i want to be and how i see myself it happened look what boils down to you know geez i really acted like an asshole right then you know I, i'm sorry i didn't mean to it's not how i should have handled it. it you know it happens to everybody but but right. you talked about you talked about some people aren't even into um self-help um it's about being on the path okay mm -hmm. it's about you know, just because you're on the path doesn't mean that you don't stumble sometimes, but right. getting on the path is what's so important. You know, yes. just by picking up my book, your book, uh, even having like an authentic, intimate conversation with another person where you're being vulnerable and connected, that's being on the path. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you're, you're not always going to do things perfectly. God knows I don't. And I, I do this stuff for a living. Yes. Um, but it's it's the recognizing of it and going oh, okay I completely see what I'm doing I'm acting out of fear I'm acting out of you know um, and I'll tell you I you know yesterday I had an experience um, they announced the primetime Emmys and Studio City was in competition for the primetime Emmys and you know we're like the little engine that could we have no budget we're against all these shows that are multi billion dollar shows and and we didn't get nominated. And it was, it was disappointing, but you know, I was really, I can honestly say I was kind of over it in like mm. 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. and, and I think back years ago, and I've had times where, you know, in my twenties, I auditioned for the, sh the same show again and again and again, and wouldn't get it. And I would go home and I would like to smash a chair against the wall and, you know, just the anguish I felt and, mm. and the frustration. And that was my best version of how to how to deal with that frustration and i go wow that's this guy ain't that guy do you know what i mean and so yeah. it's, it's a process it's a process yes and we're all in it yes yeah and it's a process i've had some clients say so how um how long do you think until <laughs> until i can you know feel this way or think that way or stop it whatever and i'm like dude uh, until you die until you die hopefully because if you if you think that you have reached the place then you're kidding yourself you are so believing your own bullshit because but, but it, that place is like jesus level and i don't know <laughs> hardly anybody <laughs> alive that has reached that level you, you, know, you know what's interesting is is i think a lot of people when they think about it the way that you just framed it they they see that it's going to put themselves in a constant state of always wanting more and not being able to achieve the top rung but in reality th that is true that you're always going to be climbing up and not achieve the top rung but it's not a feeling of discontentment it's a feeling of passion and yes. a feeling of i can't wait to see what the next rung brings yes and so that's Evolution. why you want to keep climbing Right. It's because yeah. there's there's always more. There there isn't a always. top rung. There's not a top always. rung. It goes on into infinity. And so the the idea that you know you can wake up every day and go, God, I'm still evolving. There's so much more that I don't know. Even though you learn more every day, hopefully you wake up a little wiser every day yes. than you were the day before yeah. because you've been doing your work. But yeah, and I think it never I think stops. It also it never stops. And I, th I think that that's, if you can, if you can understand that mindset, it's one of the greatest gifts that you can, can cultivate as a counterbalance to getting older. Because, yeah. you know, as, as you get older, life starts taking things away from you. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of people think, and they're not entirely wrong because it does help, you know, if you can achieve a certain amount of financial stability for yourself, as you get older, it does serve as a protective wall against some things. Right. But if, if you recognize that you are on a lifelong path to gaining wisdom and evolving as a human being, it makes the prospect of getting older less scary and actually exciting. It is Do you know exciting. what I mean? 
because yes. otherwise all you're all you're looking at is is a slow decline and it doesn't right. have to be that way you know no no i i agree it's it's something that i'm extraordinarily passionate about i think that um people well a lot of people who have not maybe who have let themselves go in many ways for those for that mindset and for that state of being that you have allowed yourself to be in the prospect of getting older is not a good one because right. statistics show and pretty much everybody around you that you're looking at shows you it's it's going to be loss and you know and loss of health loss of you know lifestyle loss of people you love it's all about loss and um and i think that you know if you if you don't want that you don't don't wait until you get there then to try to fix things you have to start right now right now today yesterday you need to start going i have momentum going we all have momentum going we're all going to the same place so the only question is how do you want to experience that that path that journey that that your your whole life until you get to that place you get to choose how you want to experience it and it's not going to be a pretty ride if you just let you know let things go and hope for the best you really yeah, have yeah. to do you have to cultivate all aspects of your health you have to cultivate your mental health your emotional health your physical health your mental diet you need to get it all ship shape as best you can so that you can have the best ride and not worry about loss only all, your concern is just I'm I'm at my best and now I can experience this and help other people be that's, of that's, service that's, that's to a, others. That's a great yeah. point because if you can if you can remain of service as you as you get older at, at any point in your life um it keeps you engaged. I yes. mean, you know, you know if you're if you're a person that's an older person but are able to share your wisdom with with someone else someone who's younger um that interaction is what's going to keep you young. Okay, because you're going to be relevant. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't need to have like an Instagram account and and like blah 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 to be relevant. You know, yeah. your relevance can be by providing value to other people through service, and you can do that at any age. And it doesn't require money. You no. know, it's it requires it requires your time and it requires you know listening and authenticity. Yeah, it it's just what are you demonstrating to people? Yeah. And 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 that's more important right than than any social media account and however many followers you have um the real value is yes how are you showing up what are you demonstrating what are you able to um to do to be of service to others in any way uh and honestly there's nothing really that fills your heart more there's nothing really that makes you able to live in that state of happiness than feeling like i've just helped somebody giving. or inspired giving. somebody or given something. Yeah. I, I, think truly, I think truly at the essence of most people that the feeling of giving actually is more pleasurable than receiving. Totally. You know what I mean? You know, you mm -hmm. get a shiny gift and it's, it's nice and whatever. And you know, it, it, it's ephemeral. It, it wears off. And, yeah. but, but the, the act of giving, which forms a connection with somebody, Mm -hmm. uh that, that's something that stays with you forever yeah yeah you're saying i'm i'm thinking about you uh you know i yeah. want to i want to somehow you know impart or share something with you that yeah. i feel is going to make you feel better or do better yeah, yeah. so let's um let's let's turn to i found it really interesting in your book when you talked about the difference between discipline and self-discipline right and I think that um, I think it'd be interesting to just understand the difference because it's so important to, as we touched on earlier, character development. So, which again, yes, it's the most important thing that you can do is developing your character and be figuring out how to be, you know, a human with the utmost integrity in, in all aspects of your life. So, do you um, do you, you laid out some strategies uh, for improving self discipline? Um, we can touch on those, but I'd love it if you would just share the difference. Yeah, I think I think I think first of all, it's important to understand what the difference is. Self 
self-discipline and discipline. Discipline is when you are adhering to something because there's an external force upon you that's guiding you to doing that. So, um, you know, the military exerts discipline. Uh, people that are in prison are able to be disciplined because they've got discipline being exerted upon them, okay? But it's the same reason why a guy that's like in peak physical condition is an 18 year old Marine, once he no longer has the external discipline of his drill instructor and the core um, becomes you know, a 60 year old couch potato. <laughs> Certainly not saying that about all Marines. I have nothing right. but the utmost respect for our armed forces. But, right. and, and listen, there's times that discipline is important. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, you mentioned that I study Mandarin Chinese. Um, I, I have studied on my own to an extent, but I have a private teacher that I work with twice a week. She effectively exerts the discipline on me to learn it. Okay. Mm. There are some times when external discipline is really important. I also use a personal trainer because, mm -hmm. you know, historically um, I've had periods when I've been effective with my self-discipline working out. But for me personally, um, it works better to have an external force helping me, forcing me to stay committed, forcing yeah. me to stay accountable. Okay. Yeah. But self-discipline is when you are able to um, generate uh, that from within. So discipline is the difference between working out with a trainer three times a week. Self-discipline is waking up at six in the morning on your own and going and working out at the gym. Um, so, so the idea to strive for self-discipline and everything, um, I see as being kind of the next level, but you know, there are things in life where we need discipline. And if, if, if you need an external force to, um, to help you with it, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I agree. I've done the same thing. We used to work out with the trainer because that that got me to the gym three days yeah. a week and got me the results that I wanted to have. Um, yes. Yeah, that's what people work out with. A, there are people hire a coach because we hold people accountable for the things they say Absolutely. they want to do. So, yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that because I think a lot of people probably don't just haven't given it much thought at all. And um, and it's a good distinct distinction to make. Uh, and it actually it actually takes a little bit of self-discipline to even go, I'm going to hire that person to help discipline, discipline me, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned a couple strategies. You know, you know one of the things yeah. that you, you, you have to realize is that self-discipline is the difference between what you want now and what you really want in your life. And, and you know, it's kind of like, do you want a piece of delicious cheesecake with gooey strawberry sauce all over it, which is going to taste great. It's going to spike your sugar and make you feel good for about 20 minutes. But then most likely, you know, it's not. Uh, and especially if you're like on a, uh, you know, if you're on a, a fitness program, you might even feel a little bit of guilt and remorse. Yeah. Or do you want to have a bowl of strawberries, which also tastes good, um, has loads of vitamins in it. And, you know, the story that you're attaching to that is that I'm now eating something that is really keeping me in line with my desire to be as fit and strong and healthy as possible. It's just choices. And I'm not saying don't ever have a piece of cheesecake, you know? I mean, yeah. it's just, it's, it's about being mindful. It's about being aware that if you choose to do something, understand why you're doing it, be conscientious and in the present that you're doing it and understand any potential, um, you know, consequences as a result of doing it you right know? yeah it's it's really as simple as saying does does what i'm about to do move me in the direction that i want to go or is it moving me the opposite that's and it. it and then you know you're making a value choice yeah. i would take I would one, one little step further i would say does yeah. it move me, does it move me towards my the self-image i have of myself or does it move me away? I, I, I talk about it in the, in the new book. I say, you know, close your eyes and imagine you looking the very best you've ever looked at. You know, men want to be you, women want to be with you, or vice versa, whatever your preference is. You know, uh, you're walking in slow motion, your favorite music's playing, the wind is blowing, and you're just like in a flow state. You're setting the world on fire. You can't lose. You walk by a roulette wheel, put it down on seven, it hits. That's how you need to see yourself. You need to see yourself in that flow state, that being um, your 
ultimate self image. And then you got to decide is what I'm, what I'm doing, is it moving me closer or is it moving further away? Yeah. Yeah. It's a value choice. Then you go, well, I'm saying whatever that decision is, you just, you just declared that I value this more right. than I value that. So yeah. if it's the wrong thing, if it's the cheesecake, when you vowed, you right. wouldn't have cheesecake until, you know, your birthday in next month, right. then you are saying, I value this more than I value yeah. the, the goal, the image, the health or whatever. And, you know, and, you know, part of, like we said, we talked about being on the path is that, you know, you're not always going to make the right choice because we're faced with thousands of choices a day, micro choices, but, but, but as you start to become more observant of the choices, you start to become more mindful and meditation helps a lot with that. Um, you, you'll find that you make better and smarter choices more consistently. Yeah. And then you're going to find that, you know, the, there's a statistic where they say, something like 40% of everything humans do is habit-based. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost, it's not autonomic, but it's, it's almost automatic. Yeah. And as you start to become more aware of the things you do, everything from biting your nails when you're stressed mm -hmm. to, you know, uh, you know, consistently having drinks with, with your friends twice a week after work when maybe you should be doing something else. Right. As, as you, you know, you may continue doing it for a while, but you'll notice it first and then you'll notice it and then you'll start to question it and then you'll notice it and you'll question it and you'll start to tweak it and you'll notice it and you'll question it and you'll start to tweak it and you'll struggle with it if you want to change it and then you'll be able to change it yeah and and, and that's the process yeah yeah you'll get to a point where you don't want to where it's becoming something you tolerate and now you don't want to tolerate it anymore so then in yourself too right you, yeah you know, it's, in, it's, in your, it's, your yes because it's now because because now you're developing this internal conflict and you feel uncomfortable you know like that's telling you that's a message that's your intuition your gut your higher knowing whatever you want to call it is telling you hey red flag here there's a conflict yeah. something has to change you know, humans are, you know, we're so adept at being judgmental and knowing what we don't like in others mm -hmm. that, that we need to become more adept at, at identifying the things we don't like within ourselves and, oh, yeah. and, and change them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yes. I think <laughs> we, we got, we got a lot of people out there minding everybody's business, but they're right. <laughs> and that's, that's a perfect example of not being in the present. Exactly. You know, you're, you're not dealing with your, listen, you got, you got plenty of your own stuff to deal with, you know? Yes. Yeah. My, my son has a, uh, has a cap that I, that I love. I keep telling him to, to get his mother one and, and it says, mind your business, mind yeah. your business on yeah. it. I yeah. love yeah. that. I think we should just create a line of t-shirts or something. Yes, Mind please, everybody. Tonight. It's the best advice you could give. None to... yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah. So some of those, I know we're closing in on an hour, so I want to be respectful of your time. Do you have time to tell, you told a story in the book that I thought was pretty amazing. Um, if you have time, I'd love for you to share it real quick, where you ended up in the emergency room in Vegas on Christmas Day, basically in a fight for your life. I mean, you know, it's a, it's such a great story, but I'd love for you to explain it if you can share, but explain why this event actually brought you to the brink of despair. And then what changed your mindset that propelled you to what became a pretty miraculous recovery? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encapsulate this hopefully in about yeah. seven minutes. Because I can tell you the story, going... I, yeah. I can tell you the story of what happened, but I would rather tell you the story of what happened and how I relate it in way of the cobra. Okay. So, right. so wait a second. Human is being... this your going rogue story? No, is this... this isn't my going rogue story. Oh, okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. So you know, look, human beings rarely have the ability to see the thirty thousand foot view. You know, it's very difficult for humans to see over their immediate vista, the horizon. Right. So. When I got the role in the Karate Kid 3, um, I got it through an open call. Uh, John Avelson, who had won the Academy Award for Rocky, directed the first two Karate Kids, plucked me out of a line of 1,500 people. And I screen tested with Ralph Macchio, thought I did really, really well, and was convinced I was going to get this role. And a few days later, I got the crushing information that I didn't get it. And I thought I was, I, I honestly didn't think that I had ever felt despair to that level before. 
about a week and a half later, I get a call from the studio and they, they just tell me to come to the studio to the producer's office. I mean, I, I knew it had to be something good. I figured maybe there's like a buddy for the, for the main bad guy. Mm -hmm. you know, I knew they were going to call and tell me that I didn't get the part twice. Long story short, I wind up getting the role. I am walking on cloud nine. This was a role that everybody in Hollywood uh, wanted. It was a career changing role. I get the role. Now I'm on top. Uh, we start training for about a month. We get into principal photography for a couple of weeks. And I start having some pretty severe pain in my left thigh, which I attributed to all the martial arts I was doing. So I was taking aspirin to, uh, you know, to deal with the pain. We, we broke for Christmas break and I went to Las Vegas with a friend. And as we're driving through the desert, um, the, the pain was getting, it's getting worse in my leg, took more aspirin. Um, I wound up passing out in the Dunes Casino. Uh, it turned out that I had perforated my greater omentum, which is, it sits on top of your intestines. I was bleeding internally for days. I'd lost a tremendous amount of blood. The, the aspirin exacerbated the bleeding. And uh, they took me to the hospital on, on Christmas, Christmas Day. And they said, we don't know if we can save your life. And we have to do emergency surgery. And I said, what do you mean, what, like Monday? And they go, no, like in 10 minutes. And it was, uh, it, was, it was the scariest thing that had ever happened to me. And um, I told the doctor, uh, because you should always tell your doctor what to do when you don't have a medical degree. I said, listen, if <laughs> If there's any way, especially can, though, you just proven you took all this aspirin, and right, so, right. so clearly obviously. you knew what you were doing. Right. So I said, look, if, if you can, if you can avoid cutting through the abdominal muscles and resect them, that would be great. Because I know if you cut through them, I was out of the movie. There's no way I could heal. Yeah. They resected them. Got a call uh, about a day later from the studio from John Avelson, and there there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, hey, how you feeling? It was like you know you got you got ten days to get back to work or we're gonna recast. And I went from, you know, I, I hit the absolute depths of despair again. And then shortly after that, those feelings of despair turned into anger. And that anger became my why and fueled me to get out of bed, to start walking around the hospital floor, then around the hallway, and then had them discharge me against medical advice to try and rejoin the film. I wound up working out with a guy from the LA Rams to, to you know, try and rehabilitate my body. Long story short, I wound up um, doing all of my own stunts in that movie, with the exception of one, which was a driving stunt. And I tell this story because I went from the absolute low to the absolute high to the absolute low to the absolute high and all of the nano shades of gray emotionally that went along with that that caused me a lot of suffering and and all sorts of stuff so i tell this story in the book about the chinese farmer and some people have heard it it's a great story there was a, a chinese farmer who lived in a, a province in the south you know hundreds of years ago thousand years ago and he had one one son and one horse and one day his one horse ran out of the, co the corral and his neighbor said what bad luck and the Chinese farmer said we shall see and the very next day the horse comes thundering back at the head of six stallions right into the uh right into the corral and the neighbor said what good luck now you can ply your fields in a seventh at a time and he said we shall see and the next day, his son, the farmer's son, went out to break one of the horses because they were wild, was thrown to the ground, broke his leg, which was a life-threatening injury at that time. The neighbor said, what bad luck? And the farmer said, we shall see. Well, the next day, the local warlord came at the head of 100 men to conscript all the young men from the province to take them off to a faraway war. But the farmer's son couldn't go because he had a broken leg. The neighbor said, what good luck? And he said, we shall see. And on it goes. And yeah. so the point that I use with the story about how I got the role you know, I thought I, I didn't get the role. I got the role. I thought I lost the role. It's we shall see. We never know what in the immediate ostensibly seems like a negative turn of events right. may wind up being very, very positive. You know, I talk about that. I, you know, my, my first marriage ended in divorce and I, I was absolutely crushed. I, I, I felt that it was such a failure and, you know, that I had let myself down and I was let down. And in reality, you know, it, it opened me up to meet my wife, Michelle, my soulmate, 
we just celebrated our 10th anniversary and had that not happened and had I not gone through that, it never would have happened. I wonder though, if I had cultivated the attitude of we shall see, would I have been able to save myself a lot of the emotional yeah. turmoil and pain? Now look, yeah. you can arguably say, that that pain and turmoil can be a catalyst to help you change. And there is a reality to that, but I think you only need so much pain to change. You know yes, I mean? yes, yeah. So, we so can, you, yeah. a little bit of anguish goes a long way. A long way, right? Right. <laughs> right? So, yeah. so that's the story of how I, how I almost lost my life and the lesson that I learned from it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I just thought it was so great because it was really so, um, I mean, your mindset and your feelings, you know, just all over the place, uh, up and down and up and down. But ultimately, your mindset is what allowed you to to prevail, have a miraculous recovery and hold on to your role that meant so much to you. Because I, I had I had a why. My why was, you know, you know it, it was not only that I wanted this role so badly that would have been a pretty good why but my real why when you distill it down was my my um i felt that it was so unjust i felt yeah. that that the fact that i was being treated like a commodity rather than a person that i had fought so hard to get where i was and that it was potentially being taken away and it it just ignited something within me. And sometimes, even though anger is a negative emotion, there are times when, if properly harnessed, it can be effective in, in you know, limited usages. Yeah. And, you know, and I was able to harness that and, uh, and use that as my why to propel me to doing what I had to do. Yeah, yeah, it, it worked for you. I mean, sometimes anger is, well, better than complacency. So it depends yep. on context, right? Sure. Right. Situation. Interesting. You've played a lot of, uh, you've played several roles as a bully, right? Throughout your acting career. So um, yeah, played a few, a few, a few. Um, and now you speak a lot about bullying, ironically. Yeah. So, so what drove you, if we have time to quickly say why uh, you became an anti-bully advocate? You know, I, I grew up in a kind of uh, hard scrabbled uh, steel town in Western Pennsylvania. Um, I, I was a chubby kid with glasses. I was one of five Jewish kids in the entire school. And I, I found myself the uh, target of bullies uh, frequently. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, it had a profound effect on me. And it's, I, I, I eventually found my, my oasis or my sanctuary in the local movie theater, you know, and that's kind of where I met my first mentors and you know Clint Eastwood is the outlaw Josie Wales who, who sort of taught me about quiet cool and Rocky Balboa who taught me about you know being an underdog and fighting back and Obi-Wan Kenobi who taught me about mindfulness and also you know they they planted the seeds of of my love for cinema and wanting to be an actor mm. um, but you know I was able to basically kind of hide out in the movie theater and when the lights went out at least for that period of time I didn't feel like I was you know, the prey. And right. um, eventually, you know, I found my, my way into a, a martial arts dojo and, and that profoundly changed my life. But I've never forgotten, um, you know, the horrible stuff that I went through when I was bullied. And to this day, um, I am just, you know, extremely committed to being an advocate against bullying. Um, I go and speak at schools uh, to elementary school kids and older and facilitate a dialogue about it. And, you know, one of the things I never imagined would be such an amazing byproduct of having done the Karate Kid 3 is that when I go and speak to these kids, we usually play a clip of me from the film. And I said, would you believe that that scary guy used to get bullied? And they're like, no way. And I was like, yeah. And it, it, it effectively acts as a nexus for me to reach these kids because, yeah. you know, when you have a, when you have an age gap, you know, you got a very, you know, thin bit of light coming through the window to try and reach them before they just sort of think that you're, you know, yeah. you're irrelevant. They write you off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that gives me that little crack that I can then, you know, lift up and, and, and reach them. And that has been one of the most amazing gifts of that mm -hmm. movie. So, yeah, it. I'm a passionate advocate for it. I love hearing about that. We need more of that because it seems like, I don't know, since I was in school, it seems like it's gotten so much worse. 
I don't oh, it remember happened. it being oh, a it subject happened. at all when I was a kid in school. I mean, that was like with, with the internet. Know, I mean, it's it's horrendous with the internet. You know, I mean, yeah. You know, first of all, first of all, kids don't realize, and and they should, that what you put on the inter internet is there forever. That your future employers are going to look at it, and we live in a society where you are going to be judged for what you did as a sixth grader. Yep. Uh, it's not fair. Nope. You should be allowed to make mistakes, but this is the life we we live in now. Okay. And the flip side or another side of that is that, you know, whereas kids used to get bullied at school and after school and whatever, when I was a kid now, you know, with cyberbullying and the stroke of, you know, a key, yeah. kids, are getting, kids are getting bullied 24 hours a day to hundreds and hundreds of people, if not thousands. And, you know, teen suicide is the fourth leading cause of death among adolescents. And being being bullied is a tremendous contributor to yeah. what is also a pandemic because it, it happens worldwide. And um, yeah, uh, the internet has really uh, taken it to to uh, another level. Mm, I know um, it, it's bizarre to me that be, it's so well known. It's documented. There's data that they haven't developed yet some sort of a a class a course in school that is laying out all of that information and and teaching and exposing kids to you know what they're what they're up against what they're doing to others and to themselves um by not being mindful and understanding the ramifications that can happen by your um by your immature actions and yeah I mean, People carry the scars with them from that into adulthood. Yeah. And so it's, you know, you, you, we like to think that as adults, we're, we're so evolved and we're able to deal with stuff emotionally. And, mm -hmm. you know, in a flash, you can be transported back to being that, that vulnerable kid. And unfortunately, there's a chain reaction because what it does is it, it affects your, I mean, not to sound too woo-woo, but, you know, we all have our inner child. And I think at least I can speak for myself, for a very long time, I despised my inner child. You know, I saw him as this weak, impotent, you know, little kid that couldn't take care of business. Mm -hmm. And in turn, I was angry with myself as an adult because I couldn't protect him. And, and the logic of that is completely flawed because of course I couldn't protect that little child because I couldn't have been in two places at the same time, you yeah. know? Um, and, 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 you know, you, you cut your inner child a break because you know, you, you don't expect a non fully formed child to be able to handle some of those situations. Right. Um, but we don't tend to cut ourselves a break for that. And, you know, one of the things that I, I really am proud of in Way of the Cobra is the chapter that helps people come to resolution and acceptance of their, uh, their inner child. Because it, like I said, it sounds real sort of woo woo and, but it's not, it's like, when you really think about it, and you think about this image you carry around of yourself at your sort of most vulnerable point, um, it really permeates into a lot of adulthood. And if you can um, reconcile that, right. and you can, if you can ask that little child for forgiveness, and if you can then in turn forgive yourself and create an entirely new image of your inner child, right. um, it, like, it's really healing. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's so important because there are a lot of people um, that are not aware that some of the the challenges they can't seem to overcome or self destructive behavior, you know, whether it's to themselves or with relationships or whatever. A lot of those things they they try everything and they just can't figure out, you know, how to get past this this thing. And a lot of it stems from experiences in their young young adulthood or childhood that hasn't been processed and hasn't been you know brought to the surface sometimes they don't even know it's in so oh, very yeah. the subconscious right so they don't even know so it has to be brought to the surface and processed and then it can be you know put in its right place given the right meaning and um and moved through healed uh so that now you don't have that preventing you from trying to you know do the things or you know feel the way you want to feel now so it's, it's an, an amazing thing. thing it's an amazing thing when you heal it it really is it's it's kind of like wow 
that that no longer has power over me. And I didn't realize how much power it had. And, you know, I yeah. talked about the domino effect, you know, the, the inner child thing dominoes right into the inter, you know, the inner critic, you know, the inner critic draws a lot of its strength from those moments when, you know, you tried something and you, you failed and you were chastised or criticized for it. And, and so, you know, that, that negative inner child perception feeds into the inner critic and that inner critic pops up at the most horrendous times in our life, just when we need yeah. a cheerleader, you know, it, it's a heckler. And yeah. so there's also a domino effect that if you can, if you can take care of this inner child thing, it, it has a domino effect of positive things in, in all these other areas of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Sean, I could talk to you for hours because I, I feel like we, we could cover a lot of ground and probably we're, change the world. We're but, kindred um, spirits. <laughs> yeah, but I hope um, I hope you'll come back when your book is out and we can continue the conversation. Plus, I would love that. You tee up your going rogue story for. I would love that. I would love to do that, and I'd, I'd love to just tell people how to get my book if I can. It's, it's yeah, no, absolutely. On. That was my next question: yeah. is where should people find out more about you, your book? Where should okay. they go? If, if you'd like to get a signed and personalized copy of the book, you can get it at wayofthecobra.com. And if you'd like to just get the book itself, you can get it on Amazon or you can get it on Kindle. Uh, you can follow me uh, on Twitter at Sean Kanan or Instagram uh, at Sean.Kanan. And I, I leave my DMs on and do my best to try and get back to everybody. Wonderful. And you guys, it really, it's a great book. And I think um, if, if you have teens uh, and you can yes. talk them into reading a book, yeah. they would find so much. This is such a great resource and a source of inspiration. It's really, really good. I think that, I mean, even really young people can can get, you know, sink yeah, their teeth absolutely. into this and understand it. It will resonate. So it's very powerful. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, and I, I thank you so much for all of the time that you've given me today. Awesome. This has been so fun, but now it's time to wrap it up. So um, make sure that you check out Sean's new book, book Way of the Cobra. Um, and if you'd like to find out what private coaching with me is all about, head on over to lauribischoff.com. Make sure to subscribe so you will be notified when each new episode drops. Share the show and spread this really good shift around. Give us a five-star rating if you found value in it. Until next week, stay feisty, my friends. That goes for you too, Gary Vee. <laughs>